Okay, hi everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to introduce our seminar speaker today, Bill Atkinson, um, who's coming with us from Trent. He has done uh, many contributions uh, in the field of uh, strongly correlated electron systems and that's that in general. Uh, today, about ferroelectrics, uh, uh, which uh, I chose. He actually had two uh, options for what to speak about. Uh, so hopefully I do as well. Uh, if there are any complaints, I can go to me. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for coming, Bill. Okay, so thanks very much, Tammy, for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in Montreal. I haven't been, in, I can't remember, it's probably been a decade since I've been in Montreal, and it's been a lot longer since I've been in the physics building in Montreal. Um, it's, uh, so as Tammy said, my background is high temperature superconductivity. That's what I grew up doing. I still do it, uh, but I'm part of a material science graduate program at Trent for a smaller school. And so our graduate program is a joint, it's a multidisciplinary program. Um, and so I got interested about a decade ago in oxide interfaces, uh, partly because I was hunting around for something that was a better fit for a material science program. Uh, and it turned out it was a good choice because this is a, a growing field and it's a very interesting field. Uh, so I'm gonna acknowledge a number of grad students whose work appears in this talk. So Patrick, Amani, and Kelsey have all graduated and moved on to other things. Carson and Brennan are current students and uh, certainly the very last part of this talk, I have benefited a lot from their contributions. Um, and that's a picture of Trent. That's the old part of Trent. There's a river that runs through it, uh, which is beautiful in the summer. In the winter, it means walking across the bridge. And the thing about rivers is that they funnel the wind right up. And so uh, when it's 25 below zero and you have to cross the bridge in the middle of winter, it's uh, uh, remarkably cold. Uh, but summers are glorious. Okay, so I want to talk, uh, cover really just two topics. Uh, there's not a lot of time. Uh, hopefully, I won't run out uh, before I get to the end. Um, the, I want to talk about quantum pair electricity and lanthanum illuminate strontium titanate interfaces. So, strontium titanate is a quantum para electric. Um, and I'm going to tell you what that means, and I'm going to tell you what that means for these oxide interfaces. If I had time, I would talk a little bit about uh, flux electricity in these interfaces and how that shapes the two-dimensional electron gas. Uh, I think that this is um, quite an interesting field and there's still a lot of work to be done there. And then, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Instead, I'm gonna talk about uh, ferroelectricity. So what happens if you take the strontium titanate out of your interface and replace it with something that's ferroelectric? And I'm gonna address two questions. Uh, why are they switchable? Uh, and I'll tell you why that's an interesting question. And then ultimately, this work wound up being about domain walls, although that's not what I set out to, uh, to do. Um, so, so first of all, everything I'm talking about today is a perovskite. And perovskites have this uh, ABO3 chemical formula. A and B are cations. And uh, the structure, at least at high temperatures, the, the, the most symmetric structure that you get is this cubic unit cell. And the A cation sit on the corners of the cubic unit cell. And the B cation sits in the middle of the unit cell. And the B cation is surrounded by this oxygen octahedron. So that's the structure of, of the generic structure of perovskites. And specifically, I'm interested in transition metal perovskites. Um, it's a huge family of materials. Uh, and so the thing about perovskites, at least the transition metal ones, is that they've got largely ionic character. And so this means that the crystal structure is really heavily influenced by post-packing considerations. So the, the way that picture is drawn, there's a lot of space between the strontium and the oxygen and the titanium and the oxygen, but in real life, everything is touching everything else. And you're trying to maximize your packing minimize the amount of space in there. And that's because the strontium is nominally two plus and the oxygen is two minus and they want to get close together. Similarly, the titanium is four plus and the oxygen is two minus. Now, the titanium is slightly too small for the space that's available to it. And so that means, let's see if I can do this. Oh, this is going to be tricky. Uh, the titanium 
has a little bit of room to move. And so the cartoon of why ferroelectricity happens in strontium titanate is that the titanium can lower its energy by moving slightly off center towards one of the oxygen sites. So there's this, because titanium is positive and oxygen is negative, and there's a little bit of extra space because the titanium is a slightly smaller ion than it has room for. And so there's this old picture of a titanium ion rattling around inside this oxygen cage. Now, this actually turns out to be kind of a naive picture. And on the right here, so what you actually have is a phonon mode. And I've pictured here the eigenvector for that phonon mode. So the eigenvector has an almost rigid oxygen cage that's moving in opposition to the titanium atom. And the strontium atom also moves, but not very much because it's big. Okay. And so this is this soft transverse mode that people talk about. And on the right here, I'm showing you old neutron data from Roger Cowley from the mid 1960s. And uh, you're seeing two temperatures on the left, it's 90 Kelvin on the right, it's room temperature, and you're seeing longitudinal and, and transverse bra uh, branches. And I've circled the relevant mode there. So the branch that's circled is the one that corresponds to the eigenvector on the left. And it's got one dispersion at room temperature and a different dispersion at 90 Kelvin. And you can see that it's going soft at the zone center. Okay, and that tendency towards softness is the signal that you have an incipient ferroelectric transition. Once that phonon goes to zero frequency, you get a second order phase transition to a ferroelectric phase. And essentially it just means that this phonon freezes. So the titanium moves off center, the oxygen moves a little bit off center the other way, the strontium moves off center. And the distances that we're talking about are fractions of an angstrom. These aren't huge distortions of so. Now, strontium titanate, I, I love this paper. This is a paper from 1971. It's a beautiful set of measurements on single crystal of strontium titanate. Strontium titanate never becomes a ferroelectric. And so here, what you're seeing is one over the dielectric constant. The dielectric constant can be related to the dielectric susceptibility. It's just one plus the susceptibility. And the susceptibility can be related to the phonon frequency. The phonon frequency here is, shows up as in the denominator, it goes like one over omega squared at the zone center. So you can think of the plot of one over epsilon as just a plot of the phonon frequency squared at the zone center. Okay, so a good approximation, that's what you're seeing. And as you lower the temperature at high temperatures, you're getting this linear temperature dependence. Right? The, the phonon frequency is going down as you reduce the temperature, and it's following a Curie-Weiss law. So T naught in this expression here, that is the temperature at which you anticipate a mean field transition to the ferroelectric phase. That's where your, your ferroelectric susceptibility diverges. Uh, there is a small crystal uh, a structural uh, transition that happens at 105 Kelvin. You get uh, tilting of the oxygen octahedra, um, this is very common in proskites. In strontium titanate, it's not a big enough thing that we usually worry about it. It's quite a small uh, distortion, but it's there. It splits the dielectric constant into uh, A and C components. But the bigger thing that you notice is that when you get to low temperatures, below about 50 Kelvin, there's this deviation where the dielectric function stops being curie weiss like And in fact, it saturates. So it instead of crossing through zero, so signaling a divergent uh, dielectric susceptibility, which would tell you you have a transition, it just saturates at a finite value. And the thing that is really amazing to me, it still amazes me, is that this is uh, due to the quantum fluctuations of the phonon mode. So the phonon mode is a quantum object, and it's the zero point motion of that mode. So the zero point motion of the titanium atom effectively that keeps it from settling down in an off center position. That's amazing to me. When I was an undergrad, I was told that atoms will never behave quantum mechanically except maybe hydrogen if you get it cold enough. And if you think about cold atomic gases, you're getting down to nano Kelvin to see quantum behavior. Here we're seeing quantum behavior at 50 Kelvin in a titanium atom. I think that's really astounding. And it's because the well, the potential well, is so shallow. That's what's giving you the, the, the um, that's why this zero point motion has such a big effect. So where I got interested in this story was when I started learning about, reading about oxide interfaces. So you build something on top of strontium titanium. 
so lanthanum aluminate is the classic cap layer. So you have a strontium titanate substrate to grow lanthanum aluminate on top of it. And even though both of those materials are insulators, the interface is a conductor. Uh, but it's not a conductor right away. So the, the picture on the right here, this is Hall measurements of the electron density as a function of the number of layers of lanthanum aluminate. And when I have two layers of lanthanum aluminate, my free electron density is zero. That's still true when I have three layers of lanthanum aluminate, so it's not a conducting interface, but as soon as I get to four layers of lanthanum aluminate, the interface becomes conducting. So this made a big impression on me when I read it, and I decided to learn more about it. Now, there is this cartoon for why this happens. It's called the polar catastrophe model, and the idea is that the lanthanum aluminate, uh, where am I here? I'm over here. Um, the lanthanum aluminate is a polar material when you grow it along the 100 direction. So uh, you have these alternating layers of lanthanum oxide and aluminum oxide that are nominally plus one per 2D unit cell and minus one charge per 2D unit cell. And so you get voltage differences between these layers. And as you grow more and more unit cells, the voltage difference between the interface and the surface grows roughly linearly with the number of, 2D, uh, number of unit cells of lanthanum aluminate. And so this happens in other polar materials, but typically if something has to give, and typically what gives is you get an atomic reconstruction. The surface of your material reconstructs in such a way as to relieve this growth in the potential. Here, it seems that the lanthanum aluminate is stable enough that this doesn't happen. And instead, well, the cartoon, at least, is that you get a, a transfer of an electron from the valence band of the LAO into the uh, strontium titanate. In fact, it's probably more complicated than that. Probably the charge transfer is mostly coming from oxygen vacancies of the LAO surface rather than from valence band. Uh, and there's certainly a role for oxygen vacancies in the STL substrate, although people work very hard to control that they tend to accumulate right at the interface and uh, are an additional source of electrons. And then there's been a lot of discussion, I haven't seen any resolution to this, uh, whether the fact that cations intermix at the interface plays any role in the uh, formation of the electron gas. But that one's a little harder to understand because if it happens, that means it's not happening until you get a threshold thickness. Um, okay, as a theorist, I actually don't care too much about any of that. I just wanna know what model I can use and so the simplest model that I'm going to keep in my head through all of this talk is that I have some cap layer that I'm just treating as an inert insulator, except that it's got a residual positive charge. And here I've drawn the residual positive charge as being on the surface of the LEO, but it doesn't matter so long as it's uniformly distributed. Its role is twofold. It's simply equal and opposite to the electron density in the strontium titanate substrate, so the system is overall neutral. And it creates this uh, uh, potential well that traps electrons at the interface. So that's what the residual positive charge done, does. Now, if this was the whole story, this research field would have been finished a long time ago. Um, but it turns out that you can gate these systems and gating does two things. You can change the electron density at the interface and you can change, at the same time, you also change the profile of the electron gas at the interface. And a lot of work was done studying what happens when you gate these systems. So on the top left, this is a, a, an old, uh, this was the first of a series of papers, uh, 2008, uh, that showed that you get a superconducting transition. That's not surprising. Strontium titanate is a superconductor, but that the transition temperature is a function of gate voltage, and you get the superconducting dome. And because of high temperature superconductivity, everybody gets excited when they see a superconducting dome because it must be that something interesting is happening. And in fact, it is kind of interesting that transition temperature would go down again as you increase the electron density. That's not what BCS theory would tell you. This actually has sparked an enormous debate and reinvestigation of mechanisms of superconductivity in strontium titanate that's still going on today. And in the last couple of years, I would say there are some very interesting and compelling mechanisms for superconductivity involving things like Rashba phonons uh, that are, I find fascinating. 
I don't know what the answer is to why this thing is superconducting, but there's a lot of really interesting ideas coming out about this. Uh, a later set of experience, uh, experiments showed that there is a tunable Rashba effect. So if the red data here is the spin splitting at the Fermi surface, and you can see that it goes, or I can see anyway, that it goes from about one milli electron volt at low gate voltages up to about 10 milli electron volts. So that's a full order of magnitude as you sweep the gate voltage. And I saw a very interesting talk at the APS a few weeks ago at the March meeting uh, where somebody had actually uh, put a ferromagnet on top of uh, an interface like this, and they were driving a spin current into the interface, and then they were getting um, spin charge conversion through the Edelstein effect, and they were getting high efficiencies. The only downside is you have to do this at sort of one or two Kelvin. Yeah. Does that really get to 300 Kelvin? 300 millikelvin. Oh, it's millikelvin. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I don't see No, it's not, it's not, a, it's, it's definitely not exciting from that point of view. Okay. Um, another thing that I find really interesting about this, this didn't get as much attention, but I'm quite interested by this, is that there's this Lipschitz transition. So I'm showing you here Hall measurements of the charge density. Now, the Hall effect in this material is a nonlinear function of field. So normally you would expect the, that the, uh, Hall resistance is just linear in the field. When you get a non-linearity, it tells you something else is going on. And one of the things that can be going on is if you have more than one band. And so you can fit, there's a problem in the back of one of the Ashcroft and Merman chapters where they ask you to work out the formula that you can use to fit this data. I mean, that's not the data, that's the, that's the result of the fitting. And what you see here as a result of that fitting is that there's at least two components. They can only resolve two components with this approach. At low gate voltages, you have a single component, and the black data here are the total electron density. The red is that's the density of that single component. And then at a certain threshold voltage, you see the onset of a second component. In fact, that's probably multiple bands that are all becoming occupied at around the same time. The thing that is really interesting to me, and uh, there have been several papers by different groups re reproducing this, is that the charge density in the first band actually goes down. So the low energy band starts to become depopulated as you start populating the high energy bands. That's a very unusual behavior. And it's actually hard to explain. So the original explanation invoked Hubbard physics, but I think that that original explanation is wrong because the electron densities are nowhere near high enough for Hubbard physics to be important. So we wrote a paper where we explained it in terms of flexible electricity. Uh, so essentially it's, the coupling between lattice strains and the band structure that is giving you this unusual behavior. Um, but I'm not going to have time to talk about this today, but I find this quite cool. And then recently, in the last few years, there have been a number of papers where people have swapped out the strontium titanate for something that is ferroelectric. And the data here on the right shows the sheet resistance as a function of gate voltage. And you can see you're not quite getting a two order of magnitude change in the sheet resistance and that there's hysteresis. And the hysteresis is an indication that the ferroelectricity is coexisting with the electron gas. And that's already a little bit of surprise because it, the conventional wisdom is that free electron gas suppresses ferroelectricity. Okay. The reason for this is that ferroelectricity, remember the model of the titanium rattling around in the cage? It was Coulomb interaction that was pulling the titanium off center. When you add free electrons, you're reducing Coulomb interaction, you're just screening Coulomb interactions. So that's the picture of why ferroelectricity is suppressed. It's now been established that there are a number of materials where at least you get a window where the two can coexist. Okay, so I put this together as a way of showing you that a lot goes on at these interfaces and they're quite interesting. After I put the slide together and I was staring at it, I realized that everything on the slide can it be plausibly connected to the fact that strontium tightening is almost a ferroelectric, that it's a quantum paraelectric. And I think that's the novelty that really makes these different from a silicon interface or a gallium arsenic interface. Okay, so my issue I, is really, I am kind of detail oriented. I want to know what's, what the charge distribution of these interfaces really looks like. And this was really prompted in part by the fact that a lot of the early experiments were interpreted in terms of very simplified models where you have a single 2D layer and you write down an effective Hamiltonian and you solve that Hamiltonian. 
And it makes the problem practical. It's something you can solve, but it may be putting you in a regime where the physics is completely unrealistic. So the classic um, example of this in my mind is when you invoke, you, you cram all your electrons into a single 2D layer and then invoke covered physics. The problem is, is you're getting charge densities that are uh, one or two or three orders of magnitude larger than actual densities in these substrates. And that tends to really overemphasize the role of Hubbard physics. And so this raised for me this very basic question about what is the profile of the charge density near the interface? And we weren't the first people to think about this or the first people to work on this. We were the first people to really think about temperature dependence. And temperature dependence is highly non-trivial because as I showed you already, the dielectric function is a strong function of temperature. Remember I had that plot of one over the dielectric function versus temperature? It changes by almost two orders of magnitude between room temperature and zero Kelvin. So that's an enormous change in the dielectric function. Um, the dielectric function is also a strong function of electric field, and it's a strong function of wave vectors. So all of these things are going to modulate the profile of your charge density interface. So this brings me to sort of the first part of my talk, um, which is just trying to understand how this quantum paraelectricity affects the structure of the interface. And I need a model for this. So always through this talk, lost, oh, there we go. Always through this talk, I'm thinking about this cartoon here. And I'm solving, in this case, a discrete grid model where I'm trying to get uh, properties as a function of position in the substrate. This is, a, I'm assuming, translational invariance parallel to the interface. So this is, really becomes a 1D problem. Um, I have to solve Gauss's law to get the electrostatic potential. So the electrostatic potential comes from this surface charge on the LAO plus whatever gate voltages I apply. But it also depends on the electron density in the substrate, and it depends on the polarization in the substrate. So to get the electron density, I solve Schrodinger's equation. And here I've just got a tight binding model. I imagine, so it, when you electron dope the strontium titanate, the electrons go into the titanium atoms. The titanium atoms, it's the D orbitals, they have T2G symmetry. Uh, so there's a DXY orbital, a DYZ orbital, and a DZX orbital. So I have three types of orbital here. And that's all I've got. That's the only interaction I have there. Plus, I have the electrostatic potential that I've solved for from Gauss's law. Okay. And then I need some kind of a phonon model that gives me the polarization as a function of temperature and electric field. And we have. Uh, used many different models. Qualitatively, they're all similar. Uh, quantitatively, it's really a question of which one is best suited for the problem we're working on at the moment. Um, so for this particular project, we use this quantum anharmonic phonon model. I'll show you more about this on the next page. What I wanted to, to, to emphasize here is that we're solving three coupled equations self-consistently because to get the potential and electric field, you have to solve Gauss's law, but that depends on knowing the electron density and the polarization. So everything depends on everything else. Solving these equations self-consistently is hard. And my students spend a lot of time getting their code to converge. It takes, this is the, the rate determining step in these calculations is getting convergence. It's really, really hard. Um, okay. So the quantum phonon model, this is an old model from the 1970s that we resurrected. It, it, um, it's a model for this one phonon mode. Okay, so this mode uh, is characterized by a displacement X. You can think of this displacement as the relative coordinate between the titanium and the oxygen. So imagine the center of the oxygen octahedron and the titanium atom, and then there's a relative coordinate between those two points. All right. When X is zero, the polarization is zero. You can relate X to the polarization by this expression here. Q is just an effective charge. It's a fitting parameter. You can get it by modeling the dielectric susceptibility. Uh, we have a kinetic energy term for the mode, and N here is an effective mass. You can get that by, by fitting the, um, uh, the phonon spectrum. And then this second term here, uh, this is a quadratic term, so it's your spring constants for your model. 
And I and J here represent lattice sites. So this is in real space. So these are just matrix elements coupling different lattice sites. Alpha are your different polarization directions. In the end, we just keep one polarization. And then we have a quartic term here, which is where our anharmonicity comes from. Okay. And so the two things that make this a model for a quantum paraelectric, the first is that this matrix D for the spring constants has a negative eigenvalue, which makes it unstable to a ferroelectric transition. And then the second thing that makes, so this term, sorry, is stabilized by the quartic term. The quartic terms are hard to deal with. And I always just go straight to mean field theory until somebody tells me I can't. Um, and so you can do a mean field de decomposition. I have four powers of the, uh, the displacement operator here. So two of them show up as just an expectation value. This is actually a fluctuation term uh, because it's expectation of X squared. And then the other two are just remain as operators. And all I'm doing here is we're normalizing my D matrix. So that it now no longer has negative eigenvalues. So this is not a trivial renormalization because this x squared term is a function of position in my substrate. So it's possible um, to have localized uh, states in my substrate from this Hamiltonian. Uh, it's also a strong function of temperature. So this temperature dependence that I'm going to show you on the next slide is all coming from this x squared term. Okay, The temperature dependence of the dielectric function is buried in this fluctuation term. Okay. Uh, yes. Just the last term is the electric field. Or is this, right. The last term here is the coupling to the electric field that we solve for from Gauss's law. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So we're actually solving four equations here: the electron density and the four. Uh, sorry, the uh, potential from Gauss's law, the electron density, the average displacement, which comes about because there are internal electric fields, and then the fluctuation term. And these all have to be solved in a, in a giant iterative self system. OK, and so this is the results. These are the results. Um, I'm showing three sets of results here. The horizontal axis is distance into the substrate. So I have 800 layers of strontium titanate. The lanthanum aluminate is not in this picture because it's just inert, but it's off to the left. So zero is my interface, 800 is the back wall. And I'm, the vertical axis here is temperature, so between zero and 100 Kelvin. And I've got three electron densities. So uh, this top panel, N2D is 0.5. That means I have a half electron per 2D unit cell. So that means that if I integrate my charge density from the interface to the back wall, I get a half electron per uh, four angstrom by four angstrom unit cell. Okay, so that half electron is the ideal polar catastrophe uh, value. That's what you would expect to get. That actually does show up in certain, there are certain people who've grown different cap layers other than lanthanum aluminate, and they get something close to a half electron, but it's not, Typical, much more typical is something around 0.1 electron per 2D cell. And you can gate these things all the way down to a metal insulator transition that happens at around 0.01 electron per 2D unit cell. And that's the case on the bottom here. And so these contours, I don't know if I said this already, this is the log of the electron density. So you can see that there's two components here. There's a component that's very strongly confined to the interface. This is quantum in the sense that it has a well-defined band structure. You can resolve individual bands. This has been seen in ARPA's experiments. And then there are these tails that extend way into the substrate. And as you lower the total electron density, you can see that the interface component gets weaker and then eventually goes away. But the tails are there and they have this kind of universal structure. And it's a kind of funky universal structure. Initially, when you start at zero Kelvin and you start raising the temperature, what you see is that the electron density spreads away from the interface. And that makes sense. You're thermally exciting your electrons. They're going to spread away from the interface. But then as you go to higher temperature still, the electrons start moving back towards the interface. And that is kind of odd. I'll tell you right now, qualitatively, it's because your dielectric function is dropping as you raise the temperature. That means that the electric fields are no longer screened as well, so the confining potential gets stronger. And so that's what's pulling the electrons back to the interface. So that, in some sense, is not surprising. I don't think anybody had looked at 
the electron density like this before us, but the explanation is pretty intuitive. What's not intuitive is that this behavior can be, um, can be uh, traced back to the presence of a quantum critical point. So to understand this, we need something that's mathematically tractable. And so like all good theorists, we start making approximations left, right, and center, but at least we have numerics that we can compare our analytic solutions to. And I will simply tell you that they look, they match pretty well. So we still have to solve Gauss's law. Uh, for the electrons, at least in the tail region, I can make some kind of semi-classical approximation that won't capture the stuff near the interface, but at least should describe what's going on in the tails. And then we can take a continuum version of our phonon model. We've thrown out the nonlinear piece. So we're really thinking about weak electric fields. And the thing that controls the behavior of this phonon model is this correlation length C. And this correlation length is actually C to the minus two that shows up here. Uh, there is a temperature correction, and then there's a correction term that comes from the polarization. Okay, so this is just a simple Landau Ginzburg type of model for the for the uh, polarization. And this can be solved analytically. This set of three equations has an analytic solution. And you find that you get a charge density that falls off like a power law away from the interface, which is sort of, class, for those of you who know about quantum criticality, that's classic quantum critical behavior. There is a length scale that naturally appears, lambda here, and lambda depends, there's a factor of temperature here, there's a factor of the temperature dependent correlation length. C0 is a microscopic length scale, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, what matters from my point of view is that when you strip out everything that's not temperature dependent, you get a power of temperature in the numerator and then a power of temperature squared. The, the uh, critical exponent u is equal to one in this model. Uh, you get a temperature squared in the denominator. And this explains the temperature dependence you see here. So initially, it's the numerator that wins and the length scale grows. And then at high temperature, the denominator kicks in and the length scale shrinks. So the temperature factor in the numerator is coming from the Fermi Dirac distribution for the electrons. So it's just the electrons spreading out. And then the temperature dependence of the dielectric function is coming in the denominator. So if I go to this tried and true diagram of a quantum critical, of a, of a, of a phase diagram near a quantum critical point, I can see, uh, so here I have a quantum tuning parameter that controls where I am on the phase diagram for us it's this parameter C to the minus two at temperature zero. When that goes to zero, that's my quantum critical point, signals the onset of ferroelectricity. Strontium tightening is just to the right of that point in this diagram. The dashed line here uh, takes you from the quantum paraelectric phase, where things just look like a normal dielectric, into the quantum critical regime where the temperature dependence matters. And that dashed line is, the the, is given by um, is the point at which the temperature is roughly equal to the phonon frequency. So you're now thermally exciting phonons, and that fluctuation term I showed you a few slides back is now starting to kick in. So that's where your temperature dependence is coming from. So the thing that then is predicted out of this calculation is that as you move yourself around this phase diagram, this crossover temperature should either shrink or grow. So at the quantum critical point, you should never see this uh, initial expansion of the electron gas away from the interface. And as you tune yourself deeper into the quantum paraelectric phase, so farther from the critical point, uh, you should see that the, cr the crossover temperature increases. OK, so that's, I think that's really cool. I don't know that this will ever be observed in an experiment. I'd love it if it was, but there are a lot of, it's difficult to actually look deep inside of a uh, of a substrate and see what's going on there. But if anybody wants to do this experiment, contact me. Um, so this actually though has practical implications because when people interpret things like transport measurements or impurity scattering, they treat things like the profile of the electron gas or the cross section for impurity scattering as temperature independent. And in almost all cases in real life, they are. But I've just shown you that the screening of these objects is going to be strongly temperature dependent. And so I view this as a warning that uh, this is something you have to be aware of when you interpret your, any experiments on transporting these materials. Okay, 
Uh, so that's the first part. Um, what time do you want me out of here? 11.50? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I can do that. I have lots of exit points. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens when you make the substrate uh, ferroelectric. So this is much newer work. Uh, and you can make the substrate ferroelectric in any number of ways. On the left here, they've replaced oxygen 18 with oxygen 16. Uh, the top right, you replace some of the strontium with barium. And in the bottom, this is a newer technique. They're actually putting uh, layers of strontium titanate, so maybe 10 unit cells of strontium titanate. You can um, uh, you grow it on a sacrificial layer that's water soluble. You soak it in water. You can then lift it up and put it on an elastic membrane, and then you can stretch the elastic membrane, and you can use that to controllably strain your strontium titanate, and you can get um, uh, transition temperatures sort of four or five hundred Kelvin with a couple percent strain. Um, so, as I've already said, people have the most of the experiments, in fact, all the experiments so far have been by uh, cation doping. I think uh, actually strain is probably a better way to make uh, ferroelectric substrates in these systems. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this is the fact that they're seeing hysteresis and sheet resistance at all. And I'll just say very quickly, if you don't think about it too hard, you would say, well, look, we have a metal because we've got electrons floating around. We know that the electric field inside of metals is zero. We can't have a static electric field inside a metal because the electrons just move to the surface and screen the field. And so this was always the conventional wisdom that ferroelectric metals, if they could be made to exist, shouldn't be switchable. And switchability is part of the definition of ferroelectricity. So people will get very upset if you call something ferroelectric that's polar but not switchable. So we've done simulations. Uh, in this case, I'm using a transverse Ising model for the to model the polarization, but it doesn't matter. The calculations are all qualitatively similar. And what I'm showing here is three different electron densities. We're still talking about interfaces. And you can see that we're getting hysteresis loops out of our calculations. So our calculations are showing or predicting switchability as well. OK. So then the question is why? Maybe we can peel back and why it's possible that these interfaces are switchable. And to tell this story, I'm just going to focus on this top branch here because it contains enough of the physics, and that's all I really have time for anyway. And we're just going to look at one of the electron densities. That's 0.1 electron per 2D unit cell. OK. And on the right here, I am showing the hysteresis loop. And I've got dark, lighter, lighter, lighter. And that each color corresponds to one of these curves. And this is just the profile. The top one is the polarization profile as a function of position in the uh, thin film. And the bottom one is the electron density, and they're offset from one another so you can see them. And so we have a positive bias on our system. And so the polarization is all pointing away from the interface, and it pushes the electrons to the back wall. The polarization is, is, is compressing the electrons against the back wall. And that's kind of the cartoon for what's going on, what you expect to go on. If my polarization is pointing away, the electrons are going to get pushed to that end. Um, but in fact, more is going on here. And what you notice is that the polarization isn't just constant and then drops suddenly at the interface, but it actually decays as you approach the interface and actually even changes sign near the interface. So we have a reversal of the polarization direction at the interface. That's really odd. And the electron gas, changes shape, but it changes shape in a way that's kind of in concert with what the polarization is doing. So when the polarization is broad, the electron gas is broad. So this picture of the electron gas being told what to do by the polarization is probably, there's probably more going on. And the thing I think I should say here, everybody learned this in their undergraduate electrostatics course, but it doesn't hurt to be reminded, where you have gradients in the polarization, you have bound charge. And it goes like the negative of the gradient. So here, where's the mouse gone? Here, the gradient is negative, so the bound charge is positive. And so that makes sense that the electrons would be attracted to that positive part where the bound charge is negative. But there's more going on. If you calculate the bound charge and you plot it as a function of position, so I'm just plotting the charge near the back wall here. So this is just this region. Here, all I've done is take the gradient of this, of this curve here, and you're seeing. Now, right on top of this, in the dashed line, 
are these curves for the electron density multiplied by the electron charge. And I've taken the magnitude so that they're both positive. And what you're seeing then is that the electron charge density and the polarization, the bound charge density from the polarization are equal and opposite, except right near the interface where you have quantum effects going on that give you discrete bands, okay? <laughs> So this is really interesting. It means that what you're getting is a compensated neutral state. The electrons are binding themselves to the polarization, and together they're agreeing on what profile they're going to take. So you're getting a bound state, a neutral compensated fluid. This also then explains why it is that the interfaces are switching, because so long as the electrons are busy being bound to the polarization gradients, they're not available to respond to an external electric field. So they're not available to screen external electric fields. And that's why we're finding switchability in our simulations. I think this is really cool. Okay. Um, so that's a mechanism that we have put forward for why electron dope ferroelectrics are switchable and why the electron gas doesn't just screen external fields. It's because the electron gas is bound to the polarization. Okay, so that's part two. Now, there's an assumption that we've made in our calculations. When, I, when we wrote that paper, Kelsey and I wrote that paper and sent it off, we got a referee report, report back and said, this is all very nice and I think it should be published, but you're assuming you have translational invariance uh, next to the interface. And we all know that ferroelectrics break up into domains. And I thought, oh, crap, okay. So we better do something about that. So the problem is, is that when you have a single domain of a ferroelectric, the top end of your, your dipoles are positive, top ends. And so you get all these positive ends of dipoles at the top surface and negative ends of dipoles at the bottom surface, and you get large internal electric fields. These are depolarizing fields. And these will actually suppress ferroelectricity in thin films, or more generally, they'll cause your film to break up into domains. And the classic, so they're sometimes called Cattell domains. Cattell in the 1940s worked this out for magnets, but it's the same physics in dielectrics, except it's more important, sorry, ferroelectrics, it's more important because electric fields are stronger than magnetic fields. So maybe you expect some kind of domain structure like this. In the 1970s, there were, uh, a number of papers proposing that you could actually have um, electron dope ferroelectrics that they, they might self dope, uh, and that in such a case, you could actually have head to head domain structures that would become stable. And the reason, so normally this head to head structure would be unstable because you can see I've got a downward pointing ferroelectric and upward pointing ferroelectric. I accumulate a lot of positive charge along this domain wall. So this is a charged domain wall energetically very, very expensive. The polarizing fields are huge. It just doesn't happen. But if you have enough electrons to screen that positive charge, they will accumulate along the domain wall. And your domain wall becomes neutral, at least in the simple cartoon. And uh, it's energetically possible to have this form. And in fact, there have just in the last few years been a handful of uh, observations of head-to-head -head domain walls. So the top one here in lead zir uh, zirconate, uh, on the left side, it's pointing to the right, and on the right side, the, the polarization is pointing to the left. The one I like here, the bismuth ferrite picture on the bottom, I draw your attention to the bottom right picture here, and that's a conductance map. And what you see is that there's conductivity along the head-to-head -head domain walls, but there are blank spots anywhere you have a tail-to-tail -to -tail domain, which would have negative charge. Okay, so these things have been observed, not widely observed, but they've been seen. Now, whether they're relevant at all for the kinds of interfaces I've been talking about is an open question. In fact, we have three pictures about what might be going on at this interface. So maybe it is actually a uniform, you know, translationally invariant for this interface geometry. It's just like what I talked about previously, but the polarization is bigger than it was without the ferroelectricity. Or maybe we get Cattell domains, these kind of lamellar domains, or maybe we get head-to-head -head domains. 
And what's nice about these systems in particular is that this is a cry for experimentalists to do these experiments, strain your substrate, and then change the charge density and tell me what you get, because you have a lot of tunability going on here. You have strain and you have electron density. So we've done some preliminary calculations. This is just what I showed you before, except we're using a Landau Ginsberg model for the polarization. Um, and this is what we get. And I have four minutes left to talk you through this picture, which is plenty of time. So I'm showing you five different charge densities, and everything is electrons per 2D unit cell. And the, each square shows you the profile. So X axis is X position in like the X direction in my substrate, and the Z axis is the Z direction. My, my cap is at the top. I actually have a little dielectric layer here that turns out to be important in some circumstances. Uh, it's an insulator, but uh, it, it um, changes the profile of the electric fields a little bit. And then on the bottom, I'm showing you the Z component of the polarization. Okay, so blue means the polarization is pointing down, and red means the polarization is pointing up. And so when I have no electrons, my model simply gives Cattell domains. So alternating blue and red. I have periodic boundary conditions in the X direction, so it really is just an infinite alternating blue and red. Okay, when I add a little bit of electrons, so point one is a low electron density, then what I find is that the electrons preferentially attach themselves to the positive ends of the polar domains. So the positive end of the blue domain is at the bottom, the positive end of the red domain is at the top, that's where the electrons go. They do leak a little bit along the electron part of the domain walls, but mostly what you have are these 1D channels, because you have translational invariants into the screen here, that have attached themselves to the tops and bottoms of the domains. As I add more domains still, the domain wall starts to tilt and eventually forms up. Instead of having these separated zigz uh, sorry, separated Cattell domains, I have a single zigzag domain wall. And you can see that the tilt angle increases. And I'm slowly working towards the kind of flat domain wall that I showed you in those previous slides. OK. And so this is just all driven by screening by the electron gas plus whatever energetics comes from uh, the quantum states of the electrons themselves. OK, um, so, the, so we never, in this particular set of calculations, we never got to the flat domain wall. And the reason is that we don't have perfect screening. Uh, to get perfect screening, it's not only that you need the electron density to be the same as the effective charge density of the polar domain wall, but the length scale for the wave pad, the electron wave function, has to be the same as the length scale for the domain wall profile. They have different length scales. And that's the case here. You can see that the domain wall is much sharper. The domain wall here is much sharper than the electron wave function. So you're getting imperfect screening, and that has an important consequences for the structure of the, of the, of the zigzag domain wall. OK, so that's where I'm going to wrap it up. This is work in progress. So this has been published, but my grad students are both working on extending this. We've only done one set of charge densities. As I said, getting self-consistency in these calculations is very time-consuming and patient-testing. Um, we've done stuff for fairly high polarizations. That's what I showed you. Um, you can get to these polarizations easily with, by straining your substrate. Uh, but for example, this strontium calcium type main interfaces I showed you previously, their polarizations are about an order of magnitude lower. And so they may be in a different regime than what I've just showed you. I think it's still very much an open question what's going on under their interfaces. Uh, one of my students, Brennan, is currently trying to understand what happens when you incorporate T2G band physics. Everything I've done, so showed you at the end there was for uh, isotropic bands, uh, just a single isotropic electron band. Um, I expect that there's going to be a strong orbital selectivity in these domain walls, which is going to feed back and affect the shape of the domain wall. Uh, but I won't know hopefully until, well, hopefully by the end of the summer, I will know. Uh, and then, of course, the holy grail here is to try to tailor band structures, right? This is a playground for using the interplay between lattice polarization, lattice degrees of freedom, and electronic degrees of freedom to try to tailor uh, electronic band structures to give us Thanks. And we're really only at the beginning of this. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone has a question? Yeah. 
Thanks for the great talk. Um, a couple of years ago, Keith Nelson's group um, published a uh, science paper that where they controlled the quantum parametric transition in this uh, strontium titanate by driving the phonon uh, directly. Optically uh, driving the phonon? Yeah, with a strong field optical pulse. Yeah. Resonant with the the uh, the transverse uh, yep. phonon, basically. Um, have you looked at the the strength of the, the the internal electric fields compared to your sort of polarization gradients and your internal electric fields to see whether or not that matches or for the switch? And then uh, a second question: How does domain dynamics um, play into switching these materials when you have to switch the entire domain? So, what are the time scales for that switch? Okay, so I'm going to answer the second question first because I, I have an answer for you. And the answer is, I don't know. That's an outstanding question. Um, that's on our to-do list. Uh, the first question about the internal electric fields. Um, you're asking, if I understand correctly, so stop me if I start going off. Um, like, I think what you're asking is, how do the fields that we're seeing here compare to the fields in that experiment? Mm -hmm. So those are dynamical fields. Our fields are really strongly screened actually by the dielectric function. So they're not strong at all. I, I don't know if I have a slide here, but they are um, of order sort of 10 to the six uh, volts per meter, which is not a strong field. Like sort of typical crystal fields are multiple orders of magnitude bigger than that. Um, that's I would expect at optical frequencies, you're kind of in an unscreened regime because the dielectric function drops off very quickly as a function of frequency. And so I would expect you to get much stronger fields there. No, actually, the 10 to the 6 was around his switch. Oh, OK. That's, that's what I noticed. Um, OK, so, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's OK. That's, that's what was weird, uh, that you could switch um, with a relatively small field. Um, given the large amount of screening uh, inside the material with epsilon being so huge. Well, but it's not huge at optical frequencies. It's only about five at optical uh, frequencies. It's, it's terahertz, so it's... It's probably also... It's the phonons, so it's... Uh, okay, so yeah, so it is huge. It's okay. huge, yeah. So then I, then I don't know why... Yeah, I yeah, have the answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's all good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I just want to ask just my mental picture. So the polarization is really, you think of the ions moving. Yeah. Um, but it's not, is it frozen? Because your domain walls look frozen, but you yeah. talked about a phonon. So, yes, I say phonon model because you can use similar models to describe dynamics and statics, but everything here is about a static displacement. Okay, so it's static. Yeah. Um, due to electric fields, but we're tying that to a particular phonon mode. And so strontium titanate is somewhat uh, special in that the vast majority, well over 90%, probably well over 95% of the dielectric response is just coming from a single phonon mode. All the other phonon modes are there, but they're kind of relevant. Mm -hmm. And then the electrons, they're all in D states. Yeah. Right. And, and what's uh, your filling? So, uh, yeah, so you're talking about actual local filling. Yeah. As, as a, um, and of course, I mean, I can dig through slides and other talks, but I don't think I want to do that. What I want to do, just go back to. So it depends where you are, of course, in the. Uh, Right, so actually, if we just look at this slide here, you can see that I'm, so this is uh, multiplying my electron densities by a factor of a thousand. So two times 10 to the minus three is kind of a typical electron density uh, per unit cell, per 3D unit cell. So they're very, really very low densities, right? We're far from any strong correlation. So you just, never need to worry about two electrons. You never need to worry about two electrons, that's right. Oh. Yeah. I, I have a dumb question. Did I ask a dumb question? No. About this slide. 
Okay. So you mentioned that this these wiggles uh, close to the back wall in the electron density are. Yeah. I think you suggested they're due to some bands yeah. uh, that form. So they're subband quantization. They're subband. So near the wall. So specifically the wiggle. Yeah. If I look at the at the electron density. Yeah. The blue curve on the bottom there. Right. There's a wiggle right next to the wall. Yeah. That is a low energy band with dxy symmetry. That band is massive along the z direction. I see. But light in the xy plane. I see. So it's tightly confined to within a couple of layers, three I to see. four layers of the back wall. So does this sharp transition uh, in the hysteresis curve uh, correspond to suddenly filling uh, a new one of those narrow bands? That so you're talking about the sharp. It looks like there's a notch that just disappears going from black to, to the next line. Um, so what happens is as you're compressing the charge density more and more towards that back wall, yeah. you're, you're um, changing the profiles of these bands so that they spatially overlap a bit. You're changing the confining potential. Yeah. And so that XY band is always filled. It's just not spatially, spatially separated. It's the lowest energy band in the system. It's always filled. It's just not spatially separated from the other bands when I have a high bias voltage. I see. So the transition you're saying has it doesn't really have anything to do with with loading this other band. So transition you're talking. It, it just looks so the hysteresis curve on the inside uh, color is color match to the, uh, the curves in the bottom, right? So uh, so you're talking about here in this inset. Yeah, that's right. And the polarization has a, a sudden jump going from the top branch down to the bottom branch. Um, that's just the point at which the states of the interface become lower in energy than the states of the back wall. In fact, that's not true. The states of the interface are lower in energy throughout much of this branch. These are just metastable. OK. Right, so you're getting. OK, thanks. Yeah. OK, and we have a question uh, from the Zoom. Uh, so uh, Rando, you're on mute. Oh, oh, hello. So thank you for a nice talk. So uh, I have a question about uh, uh, the solution of Charge density as a function of temperature. I think it, on page 19. Uh, yes, this one. So, so I just have a question about what uh, what is the parameter that determines uh, you have know, two different regimes for the I think lambda for for quantum critical and the non critical. So the temperature is roughly. 30 or 20 something yeah around 25 or something yeah uh, so the, the so the crossover that happens uh if i look at so maybe this equation here can you see my pointer yeah so this equation here is what you're asking about so uh, i just want to know what is the key parameter that determines this um, crossover temperature crossover. Okay, so it's the temperature at which the second term in the denominator becomes comparable to the first term in the denominator. So when the temperature is much less than this C to the minus two, then the, it's not really important. You can kind of ignore it, and all the temperature dependence is coming from the numerator. So the crossover happens when this denominator to temperature dependence becomes big there. Yeah, so, so uh, like, uh, what is the reason that makes you to choose this 25 Kelvin or what's a So that just comes out, the 25 Kelvin comes out of the math. I've used parameters for strontium titanate that have been, so we, our model parameters come from fitting strontium titanate. Uh, we fit to susceptibility measurements. Uh, we, we, um, we sort of have a big list of papers that we fitted our models to to try to find a kind of optimized model that would realistically reproduce the physics of strontium tightening. And so that's where the 25 Kelvin comes from. Okay, so you so let just uh, you put the ex experimental values and it turns out it's 25 Kelvin. Correct. Okay. So there's no like key explanation saying this crossover temperature locates at this uh, well it's roughly the temperature at which the i mean roughly it's the temperature at which you start thermally exciting the phonon so you have this soft mode phonon it has some frequency at the zone center that gives you an energy scale you can turn that into a temperature scale that's what is roughly setting your 25 kelvin okay okay thank you thank you
Okay, maybe last question we had from uh, Idem. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question about another interface which involves a strong film technique also. It's when you grow a single layer of uh, iron uh, sunlight and then it becomes superconductor at very high temperature. Um, can what you showed here help us explain this phenomena? Or do you know about that interface? So I know a little bit about that interface, but I haven't been following it closely. Um, so my understanding is that the sort of last plausible explanation I saw was that the big effect might be coming from the fact that you're doping the interface, uh, doping the iron selenide when you grow it on strontium titanate. But I am certainly not the expert here to ask. Um, so I, I, I don't want to, I, I probably already said too much. Uh, I'm displaying my ignorance to everybody here. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much.